Hello, everyone. I think that we can start if we have the go ahead for the YouTube channel. Sorry, I had, a, I had some problems with the connection. Okay, no problem. Now we are all here. So um, thank you for all of you for joining this webinar. I'm Giovanna Cicognani from DLL. Alessandro Tengattini and Lucas Helfer are our speaker today. Uh, as most of you certainly know, this webinar is organized in the framework of Science in School, which is a journal for teachers and students funded by uh, the Aeroform organization, which are all the European research centers in Europe. And this includes the ILL, which is the host today. The mission of uh, Aeroforum Partners is uh, to um, uh, promote, uh, by other missions, several outreach activities, such as, for example, the production of the Science in School Journal, and also a series of uh, webinars like this one, which are meant to give teachers and students the opportunity to hear directly from um, some of our scientists uh, what they are doing. Uh, the cutting edge of the European research. So as I said, today's webinar is hosted by the LL, which is a research institute producing high intense neutron beams used to explore matter to understand its properties. And as an example today, our speakers will show you how our, um, our tomography and imaging facilities allows scientists all over the world to obtain 3D images of their samples. So I'm happy to introduce you, Lucas Helfen and Alessandro Tengatini, who are scientists working at the next instrument, the tomography station at VLL. Alessandro is also an associate professor at the University Grenoble Alp, where he focuses on couple process in porous media. And Lucas, before joining the LL in 2019, was a scientist at a Beamline in uh, at the SREF, which is an European um, research center synchrotron here, yeah, close to the LL. And uh, his research is directed towards energy materials. So I let them speak now and uh, enjoy the talks. Wonderful. So you should now see my screen, hopefully. Uh, essentially, what we'd like to talk to you about today is uh, tomography. So the 30 second explanation of what tomography is, is essentially an extension of uh, 2D radiography. We're all familiar with radiography. If you go to the hospital, uh, hopefully not, but you probably are aware of it you can take a radiography of your hand. And essentially what you will mostly see is the bones because they are a bit more dense. So the tomography extension is just, you, instead of taking just one projection along one plane, you can acquire different projections along different planes. And once you have all this angular information about all these different projections, you can back project it as we'll see much more in detail later and get a 3D image. Now this 3D image is not just a outer surface of our object, it's not just the bones we see, but it is in general uh, a bit of everything that is inside when, with different kinds of contrast as we will study in detail. But ultimately what it is, it is a 3D matrix, a 3D array of uh, attenuation coefficient. Now, this might be sound a bit confusing, but we'll get much more in detail and hopefully this, what, what I just said is gonna become much more clear. So let's let's start from this simple 2D example. You take uh, uh, your, you, broke a bone, let's say, you implant a titanium implant there, and this is what a radiography will look like. But uh, if we try to zoom in a little bit, you can start seeing uh, pixelated details. And if we zoom in even further, what it is essentially just a 2D grid of values. Uh, now, what are these values? Well, values for a computer are just numbers. This, it doesn't understand uh, anything else, really. Just you can only understand numbers. Uh, and it is us typically telling uh, to the screen or to the printer, well, this value, which is, uh, I don't know, uh, 220, is assigned to this specific, uh, it looks this, this gray. And this other value, which is 110, is a lot darker. And when we adjust the brightness and contrast 
in a, in a phone or, or in, a, in a computer screen, all you're saying is that, well, I'd like your brightest bright to be this number and your darkest dark to be this other number. Now, these are 2D radiography, essentially. It's just a 2D uh, array. It's a 2D uh, composition, a puzzle, in a sense, of different attenuation values. And we'll see exactly what they mean. But what I'd like to uh, specify is that the extension to 3D is actually, in a sense, quite banal. It's uh, instead of being a, just a 2D array, a 2D puzzle, it's a 3D puzzle. It's a little cubes, right? So the same values apply from for a certain area of space, which is not anymore just a square, in, as in a pixel, but it's going to be uh, a 3D, so a voxel. It's a, instead of being picture per element, pixel, it's going to be voxel, so volume per element, voxel. Uh, what do those values mean? Now, we, we've seen 110. What, what does that represent? Well, it depends on what you are uh, illuminating your object with. So, for example, in the case of X-rays, what, what, uh, what X-rays interact with is the outer electron shell of the atom. So, as, as you probably know, uh, an atom is made of a, of a nucleus which contains protons and neutrons and a number of electrons just spinning around it. Uh, because the X-rays interact with this outer electron shell, so these uh, electrons spinning around the atom, the more uh, the more electrons we have, the more this object will look opaque. Uh, so, for example, if you go from very light elements such as hydrogen, uh, air, these kind of things, uh, you will have that the objects are mostly transparent to X-rays. And as you start going towards heavier and heavier elements, so metals, uh, uranium, these kind of things, they become more and more opaque because you keep adding these electrons around the atom. Now, in the case of neutrons, this is not as intuitive because the neutrons will interact the nucleus of the atom. So we have very light elements such as hydrogen and boron, which are very transparent to uh, X-rays and they're very opaque to neutrons. And vice versa, you have very heavy elements such as lead, uh, which are almost transparent to neutrons. So it's, it's a bit less intuitive and we'll get more in detail uh, to why uh, and when we can exploit this interesting difference. Uh, if you look at the periodic table, it repeats essentially what we just said. If you go from very light elements or just, a, to the, for example, hydrogen, which only has a proton and an electron spinning around it, it's, it's very light. It's very, uh, it's very transparent. And as I go down the periodic table, it keeps on increasing the opacity. And uh, uh, conversely, when I look into the neutron part, I have very light elements that are very opaque and very heavy elements that are quite transparent. It is an important uh, complementarity of these two techniques. What does it mean in reality? Well, let's take a picture of the camera, for example. And in the X-ray, you can see here all the plastic parts are uh, quite transparent. Uh, all the um, all the uh, uh, metal bits, though, they they become very, very, very opaque. Conversely, when we take the same image in neutrons, all the metals they they become almost transparent all of a sudden. But the plastic bits, for example, the plastic of the flash, the plastic of the cover, or the lithium contained in the battery that that powers the camera. Uh, they are very, very opaque. Let's take a completely different uh, material that you are probably sitting on in a way or another. It's concrete. It's uh, the most used fluid in the world after water. It's everywhere, and we make a, a huge amount, uh, uh, use, use a huge amount per year. Uh, what is it made of? It's made of little aggregates, so just essentially just large grains of sand, a cement paste that binds them together, and there's a lot of little holes, which we call pores. Now, when we take a tomography of this object, we can take, for example, a horizontal slice just to see what it looks like of this tomography. And we can see that it's very easy to see uh, the pores because they are transparent, that it's just air. So we said air is transparent to X-rays. But conversely, the grains in the cement are very, very similar. They, they have the same opacity. But when we do the same thing with neutrons, all of a sudden, uh, the grains, because they are made of quartz and oxygen, uh, they are very transparent. So paradoxically, it's very easy to distinguish the cement from the grains, but all of a sudden it's the pores and the grain that are too similar to be able to easily distinguish. So you can start seeing that these two techniques are incredibly complementary. So it is only sometimes using both techniques that I can understand completely what an object is made of, looking inside the object and recognizing the different components. And understanding what an object is made of is very many times, very often the essential step to try and characterize it and make it better and improve it. So how does a tomography actually work? Uh, let's take a very simple material, just a sand. You can go to a garden, you can go to the beach and get a little bit of, little bit of sand. And all of a sudden you have, a, you put it in an X-ray uh, tomograph, for example, in which you'll have a little source here on the left and you'll have a detector there on the right. 
And this will shoot a number of rays, which are just my individual photons, and will shoot a lot of them, and will create a nice little cone, for example, in a typical uh, uh, hospital scanner. Now we put our object inside our scanner, we have characterized what the beam looks like, and all of a sudden we impact this object with a number of, of photons, essentially. X-rays are just photons. Uh, and uh, these photons will penetrate a little bit through our object. It will, some of them will manage to go through and some will just get absorbed or, or bounced off. So uh, eventually what I have on my detector, what I, what I can measure on the other side is, is, is a variation in the opacity. Just as like in the hospital, if you take a horizontal slice of this object, you say that, well, there's not, there's, it's very transparent and then there's a bone, so not very transparent, and then it's a bit more air, and then there's a bone, and another bone is very transparent. So this alternation is essentially a, a line of pixel in our, in our acquisition. But this is a radiography, essentially. You're just measuring how many of your photons survive. You have a certain amount getting in, you, some of them will not survive, and you're, you're trying to see how many get to the other end of your sample. Now, all you need to do is to repeat the operation in a number of different angles. And you can see here that the, depending on the angle, the, uh, the, the radiography will look different, of course. And once you've acquired enough angles, then you'll have, you'll have all in a, a large field of information. So this is, is enough. You acquire a number of projections at different angles. How does it work, though, to reconstruct a 3D object? How do we rebuild our 3D image? Well, let's work backwards. Uh, instead of trying to, uh, now from, from this information we accumulated, we know that in, in this area, for example, uh, in, this little, uh, in this little bump here, it means that there's going to be some material here on the back somewhere. We don't know where it is at the moment. So let's just assume that it's homogeneously distributed along that, uh, in between the detector and back in the source. Same here, there's another little bump. So we know that along this bump somewhere, there's, a, there's, there's gonna be some information, right? So we are what we call back projecting. We have this information projected on a plane and we are saying, I don't know where it is, but it's gonna be somewhere there. Uh, now we repeat this operation. We acquire not just this angle, we acquire a number of angles, right? So we can accumulate all this information from all the angles we have accumulated. And if you have a good eye, you can start seeing that here in the middle, we already start building a little cylinder and our sample was somewhat cylindrical. And you can already see that there's areas will definitely have a little bit more attenuation. It's a little bit more opaque than in, in its neighbors. All we need to do now is to have enough information. And for example, with 17 projection, this is what it looks like. You can kind of tell that there's, there's a cylinder somewhere, but it's very, very nice. It's very messy. But as I start adding more and more projections, adding more and more information for more angular position, all of a sudden I can start seeing a bit more until when you have, let's say, about a thousand projections. Well, here's an object. You have a 3D uh, information. I'm just representing a, a horizontal slice of it, but it's a full 3D volume. And you can see that this, uh, this, this little object is made of tiny little grains that just a, a sample of sand in this case contained within a cylinder. Now you can already see uh, by looking at these images that an important aspect when, uh, when looking at an image is its quality. And we're not gonna get into the details of image quality, but there's a, num a number of things that can characterize. One is the signal to noise ratio. So essentially how much information I have. A simple way of looking at it is when you take a picture in the dark at night, you'll see it's very grainy. There's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of noise. And that's because the, the ratio between your, the background noise, the natural noise of uh, the graininess of your camera itself is very close to the signal itself. Whereas if I take a picture in the middle of the day, even if the exposure is very short, uh, my signal will be nice and crisp. But there's also other factors such as the blurring. If you have taken a camera and you have it a little bit out of focus or there's a smudge on the lens, it's gonna look blurry. So there's a number of things that needs to be optimized when acquiring an image to get a nice crisp object. Um, another important thing is the trade-off between the resolution and the size of your object. So uh, if, for example, thinking of, the, of, the, of a lab scanner of, of, a, of a hospital scanner, if I take my object very, very close to the source in this case, uh, I'll, I'll, I will have a very high resolution. I'll be able to see tiny details of my object, but I will not be able to see many uh, of these grains, many of these objects. Why? Because, well, my detector will only have a limited number of pixels, will only have a limited number of, of chunks of information. I can do the opposite. I can, I can have a much coarser idea of a much larger object, but of course my resolution is gonna, is gonna suffer. So there's always a trade-off between how accurately you see something and how much of it you can see. And 
which one of the two is interesting, it really depends on your problem. Because if you look at the sand at the level of a whole coast, well, you don't really care about the individual grains. But if you start trying to understand how the different grains interact together, well, you better have an image that, that in which you can see the grains. And if you want to pass to the step after, trying to say, okay, maybe in some condition these grains can break. For example, if you build a house on top of them, they will start breaking. Well, then you need a very high resolution. You need to focus uh, on, on a much tinier area. So depending on, depending on your problem, you can study uh, the same thing at different resolution but resolution is not the only parameter as you've seen uh, you might want to have more of them at lower resolution or, or fewer of them at much much uh, more uh, high quality okay let's we, we've mostly seen examples now about about x-rays but uh, we were talking mostly about neutrons today we are we're a neutron center after all so what are the advantages of neutrons well i i imagine that you know already be a little bit the x-rays you've seen some images of uh, of bones or 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 of the inside of an object but why use neutrons well uh, the truth is that neutrons generally have a much higher penetration power. So, for example, if I have an object within within lead, uh, I, I can I can irradiate it for for essentially hours, and I can barely go through. But if I repeat the same operation with the, um, with neutrons, after a few seconds, I'm fine. I can I can just penetrate. Also, there are some elements such as hydrogen and lithium, which are very transparent to X-rays, which are very, very opaque to neutrons. And this brings some to some beautifully paradoxical images, like if you put a flower behind a, a layer of granite, which is very dense, which is very hard to penetrate with X-rays, essentially you barely see it with uh, the granite with neutrons, and you'll see very nicely the flower. Or if you take a flower and you put it in a in a, in a container made of lead, you can see the flower and barely can see the, the lead, which is in some cases very important to have this, this alternative uh, uh, penetration. There's very low radiation damage. As you probably know, you don't want to spend too much time behind an X-ray an X-ray machine uh, because it can uh, it can be quite aggressive. It can it can it can damage a little bit your um, uh, the, the DNA and, and and the tissue in your in your body. Uh, neutrons are a little bit more gentle in this respect. I still wouldn't recommend a person to do it, but if you're trying to study, for example, plants, uh, X-rays can can really affect their behavior, whereas neutrons will tend to be a lot more gentle with them. And also we are isotope sensitive. This is a slightly more complicated thing, but we'll see it more in detail. But essentially there are elements which have more or less neutrons in their nucleus. And those are called isotopes. And uh, because we interact with the nucleus and not with the electron shell, elements which are very, very similar from a chemical and a physical point of view will have possibly very, very different attenuations. And that's the case, for example, of normal water and heavy water. Uh, but we'll see that more in detail later. And finally, neutrons can directly see a magnetic field. So there are, there, are, there are ways in which you can directly see essentially how a magnet warps the magnetic field around it. And it's very important in some cases to really understand them. We can get 3D images of this. We can really get uh, not just uh, the amount of the, uh, of the magnetic field, but it's, its direction and its orientation in space, in 3D. So a, a full 3D image of vectors. So let's take a very simple example to try and understand the difference between X-rays and neutrons. The simplest example in the porous media you can think of is, I'll take a rock and I put it in contact with some water. Now, as you probably know from going to the beach, as soon as you put something porous or a sponge, for example, next to water, by capillarity will tend to suck up the water. Uh, and if I try to take an image of this with X-rays, what I see uh, is uh, not a lot. I can, I can barely see the front, whereas neutron is, is, is nice and visible. So let's let's see what it looks like. For example, the inside of a of a coffee machine. Uh, if you've never seen it, you can see this is a radiography of a, of a coffee machine working, and you can see here immediately the plastic of the handle and of the of the nib at the top are very very visible uh, because they're full of hydrogen. And here, the water you can see it as it starts boiling, and it will build up pressure here in the corner, and this pressure will push down the water, and there's a nozzle going down. And this nozzle will uh, will be the only way for this water to escape. So the, the water will boil, will go through this nozzle. And here the interface will find uh, the cough itself and it will go through it with a very high pressure and very high temperature, which is what manages to take the caffeine out and get a nice little uh, coffee out which you want. And you can see here, as it goes to the top, it, this, this boiling water gets into a colder environment, so it starts redepositing. And you see, it's not a very stable process, which is why it makes this, this uh, very peculiar noise in the morning if you have one of these, uh, let's call them Italian coffee machines. And as, as the coffee goes up, it will redeposit and will, and will depose. And now it's not just water, now it's water with a lot of caffeine and, and very nice taste, hopefully. But, 
This is a very simple example, but let's go back to the, the example of, of our rock. What, what can we measure? What are we interested in? Well, we can try to look for where the front is, right? I can try to push this water through and try to see where, where my front is, because that will tell me something about, uh, about the rock itself, uh, which apparently quite a few videos are not going to be working. But essentially, uh, my, my front is going to be, um, we're going to be able to, to track where the position of the front is and how, uh, and how, and how much in depth uh, this, this can go. Uh, this problem becomes even more interesting when we have um, when we have cracks because if it's a very homogeneous front, a flat front, uh, I don't really need imaging, right? I can just push some water and try to wait at the top when the water comes in. But if the if the if the if the rock is not homogeneous, if the, there is, for example, a localized deformation, as it often happens in in real materials, uh, then all of a sudden I can I can see how the different uh, the fractures and, and fissures will affect. Uh, the evolution of my front. And essentially what we get here is a, is, is a 3D uh, speed field uh, and, a, a, and a deviatoric strain field. So what, by comparing images at uh, subsequent steps, what I can get is how the object has deformed. So if I load it, it might deform homogeneously or very heterogeneously. So I can compare where the water goes to how deformed my material is. And that's something you can only see when you have any information about the inside of the material. But let's now go to slightly more complex geomaterial. I can try to push some water into something which is real, a real rock taken from, from a mine three or four kilometers down the crust of the earth. And why is this interesting? Well, this is interesting because oftentimes those rocks contain something that we want. We, it might be fresh water, and we might, be want, we might be pushing it with salt water because we want to extract it to, uh, to give water to people. Or it might contain hydrocarbons, which we use to uh, power our vehicles uh, and power our entire society. And you might want to see how effectively you can push this water, you can push this oil through a rock. And uh, uh, the truth is that the, 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 the images we saw before were nice homogeneous rock, but the truth is a lot more complicated. And you see here, as I start injecting, the water will mostly go through the fissures. It will accumulate in certain regions which are, which are really uh, thirsty of water. They really want to keep the water, typically when there's clay and this kind of material. But the truth is that this was a dry rock. So it was a complete dry rock in which I've, I've, pushed, uh, I've pushed a fluid. In, in truth, in reality, oftentimes these rocks have uh, already have a little bit of fluid inside. For example, the fluid that I want to extract. What then? What can we do? Well, we mentioned before that uh, uh, neutrons are isotope sensitive, uh, which means what? Which means that if I take a normal hydrogen and a so-called deuterium, which is the same thing, it's just as a proton and an electron going inside, is just that in deuterium there's also a neutron going around it. And because the elements interact mostly at the level of the outer electron shell, these two atoms will behave very, very similarly. And uh, uh, as I can do, I can make water from hydrogen. So I take two uh, atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen, and put them together and make my everyday water. If I take two atoms of deuterium and I put a, a normal oxygen inside, I will make so-called heavy water, which is like normal water, just a little bit denser. But the interesting thing from a neutron point of view is that they will have very, very different opacity. They will be very different for the neutron. So that the first flush I've done here actually was done with the, with the uh, heavy water. But then now the fluid is saturated and I can push it again. And despite the fact that these two fluids are the same, they will look very different. So if I take the difference of the images, I can see here that my, the behavior of my fluid is very different. It's not going to be accumulating anymore here. It will just pass through this, this fracture system. So the behavior it can be very, very profoundly different between the two. Uh, what happens in 3D then? Well, in 3D, uh, I have the same information, not, not just anymore the projection we were seeing, but I have, I have a full 3D map of what's happening inside. Um, okay, let's take a different example. Uh, same, same idea, but for example, a plant. Why might I want to study a plant? Well, the truth is that the plant affects very severely the soil around it because it tries to suck out water locally around the roots. I have significant variation of the permeability, so how well the soil will allow the water to go through. And uh, this process is very, very fast, because you, you, if you ever try to uh, give water to a plant, uh, the water gets sucked up very, very quickly. So we need to acquire our tomographies very, very fast, which is, oh boy, which is what we would have seen here. If you give me a second, I will try to uh, put, to share the full screen so I can show you the video. 
share directly to desktop. Uh, my apologies for this little hiccup. Uh, 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 lots of videos I would have liked to show you, but. Uh, And here we uh, apologies, just a second for sure. And here we go. This is what the, what the plant looks like. These are very fast tomographies. Each one of these images is is just one second in time, and you can see here uh, the fronts progressing. I, I would normally able to see uh here you go this is the one and here you go you can finally see the the front of the water uh being pushed being sucked up by by the soil uh, upwards and, and and moving very fast so very fast tomography which is just one second per, per tomography fantastic let's go back to our uh to our uh, rest. So I hope I convinced you somewhat that uh, neutrons have a very different contrast from, from x-rays and that neutrons can see uh, light elements such as lithium and hydrogen. Uh, they are isotope sensitive and we can go through uh, a lot of metal. So the, these are some of the unique capacities of, of neutrons. But sometimes the question is not whether we should use neutrons or x-rays, but whether we cannot use neutrons and x-rays. So the, because the two techniques are so very complementary, sometimes it's only when we join this two information that I can get a complete picture of what's happening inside. This is a bit the logic behind, uh, behind the instrument which we have built here, which I'll show you a little video of. Um, with a bit of luck. Which is this one. So this is what, what uh, an instrument like that looks like. So the, we can see here, there's a lot of lead outside and there's a lot of concrete in the back. There's, there's of course a steel structure that holds it all together. And you can see here, there's, uh, there's the neutrons, this, this blue line, which comes down from the reactor. There's, there's a reactor of, uh, that will produce all these neutrons. And there's a number of instrumentation we'll try to very quickly go through, but there's a number of things we can do to the neutrons to change a bit their nature. But let's try to see if we were a neutron, what we would see uh, on, on an everyday instrument. So we would, uh, we would go down. There's of course all sorts of safety shutters that will block the neutrons when we don't want to see them. Uh, we can see these little pinholes here, uh, our object that allows us to make the neutron nice and parallel. And look as we get more in detail on when and how much we can collimate, we can uh, select just a small amount of neutrons to make, so make sure we have the most parallel one. And we have all sorts of things such as interferometry here to change the type of contrast. And we can see here that this, if it were the neutrons, we would just impact against our detector. But you can see here there's an X-ray source and an X-ray detector, which is perpendicular to it. And these two can be acquired fully simultaneously and can provide very different information. And there's, of course, different uh, size of the text. We can see here a big detector and a small detector. As we saw, uh, as we mentioned before, we can have higher resolution or whole lower resolution for smaller or, or bigger objects. But let's have a look at why, in what cases, we can use uh, neutrons and X-rays together. Well, a very simple example is the one of uh, once again, rocks. We've seen before that if you put water in some rocks, they, their behavior will be essentially, the, the rock will not move, they will not be affected. But there are some rocks in which as soon as you put a little bit of water, uh, the behavior will be uh, significantly different. Uh, I'll try to show you a video. And here it goes. And you can see as soon as we put in contact our, our our rock with uh, with water, it will break essentially, and this is uh, this is very important because maybe you have put something delicate in that rock. Maybe you wanted to store something uh, like a nuclear waste and like that and, and and such things in this rock. So you need to be uh, to truly understand accurately how the, the the rock will behave when we put when we put it in contact with water. And we see here at the top with X-rays, you can see very clearly the opening of the fractures. 
and that's something very important, but uh, we cannot see what causes this fracture, which is the water. And conversely, when we look at the neutron image, we can, which is here at the bottom, we can see very clearly where the water is. That's, that's the stuff in white, but you cannot see the fracture so well because the water is filling them up. So if you want to understand really the, combined, the combination of the behavior of the water and of the rock, then you need to acquire the two at the same time and join this information. And there's, uh, uh, there's all sorts of uh, questions to be asked, like how, depending on how this rock was deposited, this, this fluid will, will go predominantly along the fractures or orthogonally to this right, perpendicular to the structures, which is what we see here. But let's now go back to the example of, of, of concrete. Once again, it's, it's an object which is used uh, in everyday life. We, we are all, in a way or another, sitting on it today. And uh, once again, neither technique by itself can tell us everything about it, because as we saw before, uh, in x-rays, it's very easy to find the pores, to find these little holes in the concrete, which are perfectly natural and perfectly fine. But it's very hard to distinguish the other two components, which are the cement paste and the, and the aggregates, so the large chunks of rock that are inside the concrete. Uh, conversely, neutrons, you can see very well this, uh, this cement paste because it's full of hydrogen, but the, both the pores and the aggregates are somewhat transparent. So it's only when we combine together these two information that we can what we call, do what we call a segmentation, which is being able to actually say, well, this, this bit of, the, of my concrete is an aggregate, this bit is a cement paste. And then I can, for example, thermally, uh, that's not my day, uh, we can, uh, um, we can uh, oh, pop, 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 combine this information. And uh, you can see that with the x-rays, it's very easy to find where the fissures open and uh, with the neutrons, we can see the drying of the concrete. For example, I might be wanting to heat the concrete to see how it behaves uh, in fire conditions. So uh, I want to see uh, how, how fast it will dry because this is what's gonna determine whether a building, when it catches fire, will collapse or will be perfectly safe. And we always want, of course, to try and improve the way in which make our building safer uh, for everybody inside. Uh, and once again, the x-rays will provide very useful information about the evolution of the microstructure, in this case, the opening of these fissures, whereas the neutron will tell us where the water goes. Fantastic. And uh, I can study, for example, how these different fissures, this, this little crack that opens in the concrete as we heat it up, will make this process faster or slower. And then I can compare all this information to my nice little, nice little models. Uh, that's it. So these were hopefully a couple of examples, but my colleague Lucas will go uh, through other examples from every, our everyday life, for example, batteries. But I hope I convinced you that uh, there are some very, that these two techniques combined are very powerful together, so neutrons and x-rays. And that uh, a few details that we can go to relatively high resolution, we can see objects which are four microns, so uh, four thousandth of a millimeter, so tiny, tiny objects. And there's, there's, there's a lot of fun to be head ahead. There's, there's a, here there's a, there's a few resources about, uh, about neutrons and imaging in general. Uh, and uh, of course, we, there, there's, there's a website we have about the instrument. You can, you can go there and there's a little bit more information that we had the time to, to go through. So now I'll pass the words to the word to Lucas. Okay, thank you, Alessandro, for this very nice opening of the topic. Um, I hope you hear me all. Um, please complain if you don't. So I will share my screen. And so, um, just going to presentation mode. No, it doesn't work. Right. Um, yes. After after this this uh, uh, very nice uh, introduction on on what you can do with the neutron imaging. I would like to, to go a step back and uh, ask ourselves, what, why do we do that? So what can be the motivation for structure characterization by neutron imaging? Um, there is, um, sorry, there is the, of course, to, 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 to get information about the structure itself. So for instance, uh, get uh, statistical parameters that we want to get out of the structure. We would like to, to, to see if there are imperfections perhaps due to an, uh, production flaws, uh, and that we need to avoid uh, during produ production of, 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 of structures and materials. And then of course, we would like to, 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 to see the relationship between structure and properties. As we've seen in Alessandro's talk that uh, the, the, the permeability of, 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 of a stone or of, of, of some cement, um, how that, is that affected by the microstructure? So a microstructure to the microscopic properties. If, uh, if we 
manage to do that correctly, then we can model uh, that for simulations. And we can then afterwards uh, uh, close the, the, the loop somehow and uh, uh, perform virtual materials design by simulations on the simulated materials. And then deciding which has the, the best macroscopic uh, properties and somehow try to, to, to uh, uh, optimize these uh, materials in, uh, in a, by computing. Uh, of course, there's the, the other aspect of uh, looking at the temporal evolution of structure, what has uh, already sh sh impressively shown by Alessandro, sorry. Uh, for instance, if you, if you put a, a, a water waterfront uh, under the um, uh, concrete or rocks, or if you put a particle stream through porous structure here, for instance, if you uh, thermally or mechanically treat the, 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 the objects or, or structures, or if you want to, to, to see working devices operando, that means uh, that you do a, an experiment during the device operation, for instance, also during uh, a, a battery that discharges or uh, somehow um, uh, a current that goes through the device and degrades it, for instance, in electromigration. Uh, and of course, the aim is to, to provide a non-destructive characterization in order to be able to follow the evolution of processes. So, uh, and for that, a neutron or X-ray imaging, as Alessandro has already shown, are, are, are very nice methods because you get projection images in the radiography. Uh, so you see what's, what happens inside the structure. And if you afterwards combine it with uh, cross-sectional uh, cross tomographic imaging, uh, taking different viewing directions of the sample, as Alessandro uh, has already shown, uh, then we can get uh, to, to cross-sectional imaging without the structure of the sample and to 3D imaging so that you have uh, any, any possible direction of cut through the, through the, through the sample that you can uh, look at and even see the structures in 3D. So uh, Alessandro has already shown the map, the chemical uh, table of elements uh, with, this, with, the, with the gray, gray values showing the, the relative absorption. So uh, here I show uh, the relative absorption or the, 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 the mass attenuation coefficient a uh, comparison between thermal neutrons and X-rays, the 100 keV uh, uh, X-rays. Uh, the X-rays, as Alessandro has already say, uh, said, uh, they are interacting with the electron shell of the of the of the, of the atom, while the, the 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 neutrons interact with the nucleus. Uh, and what we see is uh, we have this that dependence of the of the uh, it's a it's a continuous uh, dependence uh, in the X-rays, but the the, the neutron the neutron uh, um, cross sections, they are very much uh, uh, scattered. So you can uh, see a very well distinguished in, in many, many instances, neighboring uh, atoms with neighboring uh, atomic, atomic number Z. Uh, so, and also as already pointed out by, by Alessandro, you, you can very well di distinguish the, the hydrogen, for instance, by its isotope uh, deuterium, uh, which is just a proton with a, with a, with a, with a, um, with a neutron in, in, in the nucleus. And uh, uh, so you get isotope sensitivity. And uh, uh, so this you can, for instance, see, see also with lithium. Here you have natural lithium, uh, sorry. And uh, uh, the, the sixth isotope of, of, of lithium is, uh, has a much higher uh, scattering cross-section or uh, cross-section than the, than, the, than the natural lithium. Um, and here I, so, uh, Alessandro has mostly shown things on, on, on hydrogen and water. Uh, I will go more here into, into lithium and uh, the distinction between lithium from, from the surroundings where we see uh, that uh, with X-rays, uh, if you have carbon, for instance, or, or hydrogen or nitrogen, oxygen inside a, um, uh, a component then, or in, in a material, then you, you can very badly dis distinguish it from from, uh, uh, from, from one another. And with the neutrons, we are well uh, 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 sensitive to, to, to the lithium due to this high uh, att uh, attenuation co coefficient. So um, I show that here with, uh, with the, the, the lithium ion ba battery principle. So that is um, uh, a principle that was uh, invented or let's say developed since the 1970s, 1980s. And in 2019, uh, these uh, three gentlemen got uh, the Nobel prize for it in chemistry. So um, the, um, the, the principle of the battery is, a, is, a, is that of an ion transfer cell. That means you have here uh, during the charging, you, inter, uh, you, you store the lithium in, 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 in uh, petroleum or graphite in, in the interlayers here. 
And uh, uh, upon discharging, it releases an electron and the, uh, the ion goes through a, a, a separator, a barrier uh, via an electrolyte and goes to the cathode. Sorry, that was a bit too fast. And uh, the cathode, uh, they're the same uh, things, same problem sort of applies again, that the ion gets uh, uh, intercalated into this uh, NMC, for instance, materials or cobalt oxide uh, cathode material. So uh, for the intercalation, you create, uh, generally create stresses and volume expansion. Uh, and that makes you that you that, 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 uh, on, on different charging and discharging cycles, the, 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 um, the material uh, works and, and expands and, and contracts. I will show you what you can do now here uh, with a with a working working cell. So uh, operando uh, discharge of a of a primary cell here of a um, thionyl um, chloride, uh, chloride uh, cell. Uh, it has a it has a, 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 a liquid electrolytes which is in a, in a, a porous carbon structure for the electrical conductivity, and uh, we have a, a, a pure metal anode lithium. Uh, metal anode, uh, which uh, is connected to the, to the outer casing here and provides negative uh, electrode. And the, 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 the carbon structure is, uh, is, is connected to the positive uh, electrode here. So what happens when we, when we discharge the battery, we see that the electrolyte, the liquid electrolyte, uh, and, and also the, uh, the, 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 the cathode itself uh, gets consumed. Uh, so it, there's uh, SO2 gas, gas and, 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 and sulfur uh, being, being produced. And we see that here, uh, uh, then the lithium goes away from the, from the, from the lithium anode uh, metal to uh, 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 these compounds that they are here forming in, in the former cathode material. Uh, if we go through here, uh, so the, the first stage and the last stage is, 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 is are the, the reconstructed slice that I've seen in, in, shown in the movie. So it's, it's not an, a superimposed image, it's, it's a reconstructed slice. Uh, temporal resolution is something like a half, a half an hour here in this case for rather slow discharging uh, of, 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 the, of these cells. And um, so what you can then see is uh, how the, the, the lithium metal here, that is a spirally wound uh, uh, bobbin type structure, Gets discharged and uh, and gets gets then uh, to 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 the to the uh, thionyl chloride um, uh, cathode material. So uh, we see that here in three D that the anode uh, dissolves and uh, uh, in the end you get even even uh, bits that are not connected anymore to the to the to the main uh, uh, anode material. So to the outer pole. Uh, and we can then see uh, how is the lithium metal consumption and how that relates to the capacity that we are drawing out of the, uh, of the battery. Recently emerging multi-beam setups for tomography require no so, uh, You can do that for different currents, for instance, the different discharge currents here are 300 milliampere and uh, 100 milliampere uh, uh, discharge currents. And you get them to something like a, like a capacity of something like 1.4, 1. 1.2 1. milliampere hours that you can draw out of the battery. Um, the same here is now for the different materials, the manganese oxide uh, uh, primary cell again. So you cannot charge it, you can only discharge it. Um, here again, here now with a, a combined combination of X-ray and neutron, because here in the X-rays, we see very well the, the um, uh, nickel mesh that uh, supports the anode, uh, the, sorry, the cathode material. And again, here the, 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 the uh, the lithium metal that gets dissolved and uh, uh, the electrolyte gets cons uh, uh, consumed here, and we see then the, the swelling of the of the of, of the cathode material, and that gives then uh, rise to cracking in the in the electrodes. Uh, so these here were experiments that have been done at HCB. I just show you, uh, but uh, it gives you a rough uh, idea what you what you can do on the scale of of some uh, uh, twenty. 20 minutes, uh, one hour scan time, half an hour, let's say. Um, if you want to go to higher spatial resolution, then uh, you, you, you need to, uh, so if you want to see, see for instance, what happens inside the, the exactly the, the, the anode or cathode materials uh, for rechargeable batteries, uh, then you need to really to, to make a good compromise between uh, uh, spatial resolution and temporal resolution. 
And uh, uh, what we are using at Next and what many other uh, uh, neutron imaging instruments do on the world, they use in, in the indirect de de detection uh, schemes. That means that you use a scintillator material in order to convert uh, the neutrons to visible light. The visible light gets collected by, by optics uh, via a mirror in order to get the, the sensor uh, to, the, to the imaging sensor out of the uh, uh, transmitted beam direction. And you have lenses in order to focus the, 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 sorry, the image onto the, the, the camera sensor. You can have two different schemes. So one here uh, with a not non-infinity corrected uh, setup that you focus on the screen via one lens or one lens system, sorry. Or you can use the infinity corrected approach where you have uh, from uh, uh, where you have a collection lens after the scintillator, and this collection lens uh, 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 gives you a much higher uh, uh, numeric aperture uh, and light light uh, uh, collection efficiency than than the other approach. Uh, so it's it's more adapted to high resolution imaging. Also, the scintillator must be finer because you uh, with this uh, high numeric apertures you are getting less steps of field. That means uh, the, the, the scintillators needs to get, get, get thinner. And there are different approaches. So you could, for instance, say, okay, I, I deposit a, a powder screen on a, on a substrate. And then uh, if, if you look then at the, at the microstructure with a microscope, you see that there's a inhomogeneous uh, uh, illumination of the, of, the, of, of the camera signal that it can be sometimes a bit bothersome. Or you could have, for instance, a, um, a doped layer of, uh, of a crystal, of a single crystal material, for instance, uh, produced by li liquid uh, phase epitaxy on, on, a, on a substrate. And uh, this is the case here of the GDG uh, uh, crystal. Um, and uh, uh, you observe then the scintillation uh, processes via the, 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 the substrate here. So you can have then secondary effects also. Here you can have, for, for instance, uh, multiple reflections between the uh, inside and outside of, of the uh, between the two insides of the of the of the substrates. Uh, here on on the um, on the on the powder screens, you have uh, uh, scattering taking place in between the powder particles. And so, uh, the, normally, if you want to go to 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 high resolution, like five microns, you you don't uh, want to have powder powder particles larger than that. And the, the general thickness of the of, of the screen um, uh, also uh, in the order of 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 of, of some microns. Then, um, spatial resolution does not only depend on the on the on the detector system, but also on the the, the, the collimation of the beam. So, uh, if you're looking at the, the neutron guide um, or at at at, at, a, at a cold source, they are very low brilliance sources. So you uh, that means that the, that the source, the emitting source, uh, is is quite large. And see the easiest way of, of, of dealing with that is that you introduce a pinhole. Uh, so you have here a neutron guide getting getting the neutrons from the cold source to the to the to the to the to the image imaging experiment. You create a total uh, external reflection here in order to keep it into the in, in the guide. And then uh, you have the, the the diameter of the pinhole that def defines you the collimation ratio uh, together with the distance where you put the sample in the end, the distance L here. And uh, uh, so the, the problem is, of course, uh, when you put the, the detector at a finer distance, uh, you will get some blurring, which depends on the on the on the collimation uh, uh, ratio that, that I've just said. So uh, the, the the relationship because of the similarity of these triangles is, is uh, that L divided by D, the diameter of the source of the pinhole, is the same as the blur as the, as, as the detector distance uh, divided by the blur circle. And that means, uh, uh, in practice, in order not to sacrifice too much uh, uh, neutron flux, because if you close the, the D, the large D, capital D, then uh, it goes, uh, uh, neutron, neutron flux goes down. And so you, you in practice, you, you're staying in something like 300, 600, whatever, uh, in order to get uh, enough collimations. Of course, it depends on afterwards how close we can go with the detection plane towards the sample. And if you do tomography, you turn the sample, you have the ideal case of a cylinder, uh, then you can really approach the, 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 the detector, the detection plane as much as possible. If you don't have a sample environment, uh, otherwise you need to have the distance of the sample environment that, that comes into account. And let's say uh, if you have thousand pixels that you want to re reconstruct, uh, then you would uh, uh, say, okay, I, I can accept something like one pixel of blur radius. Um, in order not, not to, to, to be less uh, 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 resolving than the detector. 
And so what we see here, uh, we get already with the, with, the, with the 300, we get something like three milliwatt. That means that we that, uh, that in practice it doesn't hurt too much if we if we if we if we get blur circles in the order of uh, two to three pixels. Um, okay, I show you now some 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 ex examples also uh, uh, here of, uh, again uh, uh, coin cell batteries that you that you, that you can have a look at and uh, look at the at the microstructure of, of the cathode and anode materials. Um, so at next we can we can go with very high, uh, uh, high spatial resolution. So here, for instance, the pixel size in the order of, of 4.2 microns uh, uh, with long scans. That's the, the, the inconvenience. So it is not uh, uh, so much adapted to 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 operando uh, and uh, uh, imaging during discharge of, of batteries on charging cycles. But you can then do studies on on uh, of the aging uh, of the capacity fade du uh, during aging of batteries. So if you charge them 100 times or 300 times. What happens then with the with the with the, with the, with, the, with the cathode and anode materials? Um, for that, uh, as already shown by Alessandro, we can uh, we can use both X-rays and neutrons in order to 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 very well characterize the different components of the battery. So uh, here, the X-ray image uh, uh, doesn't need to be done with the same pixel size or, or sampling, a spatial sampling. So we, here, we just uh, uh, increase the pixel size and turn the, the image right in order to to make it approximately match here. Uh, and then we can create a, a, a composite image where you show here the, 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 the highly absorbing X-ray in red and the highly absorbing neutron in, 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 in blue. Uh, for that, you can, you can use uh, an extension of digital volume correlation that is a multimodal re registration. So you somehow define a cost function and then iteratively you align the images uh, by uh, getting to an extreme of this cost function, which depends on the joint or B-modal histogram of, the, of, 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 of your sample. I don't go much into detail here, um, but what you get out then is then the, 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 the de-aligned image. So you see then very nicely uh, uh, highly X-ray absorbing uh, structures here, uh, uh, X-ray absorbing structures in red. That's the copper current collector here, for instance, the, this, this small stripe here. And uh, the casing, of course, which is made of, of, of uh, stainless steel. And you get uh, highly neutron absorbing uh, uh, structures here, for instance, the uh, lithium containing uh, cathode material here that is uh, in a discharge state. And um, what you can then do in order to, 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 to get to profiles uh, across the battery and to show the different charging states is that you, that you can virtually unroll the battery. Uh, you can do a polar transform and then uh, uh, put the different layers in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a polar diagram here. And you can then see that the different layers and the, the, the local fluctuations of the layers. And you can do that, of course, um, for the discharge state here, for instance, after 700 uh, discharge, uh, discharging charging cycles. Uh, and you can do the same thing for the charge one, which is here in the bottom uh, with the contrast increased. And if you zoom in in some interesting regions, we see that there's a lot of variation. And this uh, variation is due to the charging discharging cycle. So the material ages and it, uh, the, 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 the lithium is trapped here in, in the discharge state in the anode material, for instance, and we get also uh, uh, voids or weakly lithiated uh, uh, um, regions here, uh, both in the anode and in the cathode material uh, in the charge state. So uh, that we can then look at uh, 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 the different cases that, that we can see. We have here, for instance, voids that appear in the, in the anode material. We uh, have plating uh, of, 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 of the, uh, of the separator materials, for instance, here between the anode and the cathode that can occur. Uh, or we can see uh, asymmetries between, between the two, between the inside and the outside uh, anode, because it's a, it's a sandwich structure, which is um, where, the, where you have uh, um, uh, here um, an anode material here on both sides of the, of the, of, of the copper current collector. Uh, and then, of course, you can try to correlate that with, with uh, simulations and, and try to, to, to figure out what are the different, uh, what is the theoretical uh, uh, attenuation coefficient that you would expect, and try to model that and, and, and uh, uh, with, with the with the measured measured plots uh, uh, across these across these profiles here. Um, 
Okay, that's that was my so uh, just a, a concluding remark here on the on what what you can do with with with, with imaging. I just just showed you uh, uh, one small part here of lithium transport in 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 in, in batteries uh, uh, that is due to the uh, high sensitivity of 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 of, of the neutrons towards uh, uh, lithium uh, uh, isotopes. Um, you can you can have a look at at, at bone structures. Uh, you can look uh, at devices from particle filters where you can look at at suit inside uh, the, the, the 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 filter structures. Sorry, and uh, as Alessandro has already shown, the uh, water uptake in plants, uh, hydrogen, for instance, in metals. Uh, that all that basis is is based on the attenuation uh, uh, of, of of neutrons. That means of the of the um, reduced transmission. Uh, uh, in the forward direction uh, of the of the of the field, but you get also phase effects uh, due to, for instance, magnetic uh, contributions. Uh, so you can have a look at magnetic fields, as uh, Sondo pointed already out in the beginning. We can look at uh, ma magnetic domains because the magnetic domains can depolarize the uh, uh, polarized neutron beams, for instance, and we can then see or uh, have a look at, 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 at internal defects in, in for instance, uh, generator steel materials. Um, and by diffraction, uh, combining it uh, with diffraction in the monochromatic beam, we, we can have a look at strains. So there are uh, break edges that, that, that can serve in order to, to see either phase transformations or that, that we can uh, 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 use then to, to, to determine strains from, from, from a strain from, from by the break, break, uh, peak position uh, changes uh, uh, from the, um, uh, uh, from the, on the sample. Or you could, uh, for instance, uh, uh, what is also you can have a look at the microstructure in in uh, cultural heritage art artifacts. Uh, that is uh, uh, also a field where these neutron methods are neutron imaging methods are why uh, uh, why they use. So our colleague Nikolai Kardilov has made a nice um, uh, overview on that, a review article in Materials Today. So what are the the, the recent tendencies on on neutron imaging? If you want, then you can have a look in, into that into more detail. Um, yes, I thank you very much for, for your attention. And I would like to acknowledge all the people that have been involved in, in, in such a project. Uh, so there are people from ILL, of course, um, people from the UGA, uh, uh, people uh, from the HZD, uh, the uh, collaborate, uh, the, the former reactor in, in Berlin that contribute also to the to the new next instrument, as as as, as, as Sandro has has shown, uh, people from the SRF here, uh, the, the scintillator development, and people from helping with with reconstruction codes, of uh, from the KIT. Uh, thank you very much. And I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, we can perhaps ask, answer them. Try to answer them. Uh, okay. Yes. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Alessandro, as well. Uh, yes, we have still a bit of time for questions. I think that uh, uh, you could maybe raise your hands. It will be quicker than uh, typing your questions, but you can use both. Waiting for some question. I have a question. Which is the largest sample that you could uh, put on next? In we, we can... Uh, we have a beam that is uh, probably limited to something like a 200 times 200 mi uh, millimeter square, so it's 20 mm -hmm. times 20 uh, centimeters. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you can uh, uh, do field of view extension, for instance, in tomography by placing the, 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 the rotation axis close to the border of the field of view of the detector, and that by this you can gain another factor of uh, uh, 1.7 or something like this. Uh, but in, in the order of, of 300 millimeter, I would say that that is uh, something that is uh, a reasonable size, maximum size for, 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 for samples. There was in the old instrument. In the new instrument, we should be able to get to 30 by 30 by default. And also for tall objects like a, a blade, for example, a, a Viking saber as we had before, uh, you, can, uh, you can essentially acquire a number of tomographies at different heights, and then you can compose them into long objects. It is possible to do uh, relatively large objects in one axis. In the other axis, we are here yeah, more 30, 40, let's say, in the new instrument. With, the, with the, this, this lateral stitching, we can do taking an image a bit to the right and a bit to the left of the object. Okay, thank you.
Well, it seems that um, everything was clear. We don't have any questions. So I want to, to thank you, our speakers again. Eh? Thank you, Lucas and uh, Alessandro. Thank you, Steph, for having setting up uh, the webinar. And thank you to all you to having come to this webinar. And please follow up Science in School because there are some interesting one in the pipeline as well. Bye-bye to everybody. Have a nice afternoon and weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.